Hello, everyone, and thank you again for joining us for an E4C and IEEE virtual salon on energy and uh, renewable energy solutions. I'm pleased to welcome Ajunua Ajemini to this special edition. We were lucky to have her join us. Ujinawa Ademini is an impact investing and development expert with experience in the areas of opportunity maturation, financing, and policy. She is the Senior Technical Advisor to the Commissioner for Energy and Mineral Resources for Lagos State, the fifth largest economy in Africa, charged with the responsibility to plan, devise, and implement strategies to deliver reliable energy to the citizens of the state. She was previously the Senior Investment Associate at All One, or All On, responsible for driving clean energy investments opportunities while providing strategic governance and operational support to All On investees. Welcome, Ajunua. We're so glad you're with us. I'm pleased Thank to present you. her now. Thank you very much, and it's my pleasure to join this session. Um, it's a very exciting topic, and it's exciting time in the energy industry in general. Um, it's no better time to be discussing renewable energy, given the current discussions around climate change globally, and given how important the energy is to any climate discussion. But even beyond that, um, energy is very important for job creation, for any form of economic development, for social development, so education, health, and all of that. So um, it's really important, and it's a very exciting topic, so I'm pleased to join. Um, I'll just jump right into the presentation I had, and um, I won't strictly stick to it. I mean, I'll give some examples that are um, a bit um, outside of the thing. It's very relatable to everyone that uh, is watching. So the topic for this session is finance and investment for renewable energy solutions in Nigeria. Some of the learnings from here would be applicable across Africa and across other countries. Um, but um, the examples, some of the main examples in Nigeria, which is one of the biggest market states in Africa in general. Um, so I'm excited to be discussing this topic. And one of the most important reasons why this topic is important is that um, access to finance and investment for renewable energy solutions has come up as one of the biggest challenges facing the industry. And while the argument remains that, oh, there's a lot of funding being thrown to the renewable energy sector, some of that has been that given the huge amount of funding required, the cost of the funding has yet to get identified to be able to achieve um, the SDG 7. So I'm excited to provide some more clarity around finance and investment for the energy sector, as well as to provide some clarification around the various areas that will be considered typically by investors that consider this kind of this kind of solution. So in terms of the problem specifically in, in Nigeria, um, a large percentage of, of the population is off-grid or is underserved by the grid. Um, so the population size ranges from, from people say 170 million, 200 million. Of that, um, about 90 million people are said to be off grid, and another 30 million are said to be underserved by the grid. So it's, it's a good chunk of the population. Um, businesses keep complaining that access to electricity and energy is one of the biggest challenges they face. And, and this has impacted their ability to be productive, to create jobs. And generally thrive. In terms of the amount of energy delivered to the national grid, this number varies. Some people would say it's about 2,700 3, megawatts. Sometimes it goes up to 400, 4,000, a few times, a bit more than that. But in general, comparing this number to the typical assumption that 1 million people require at least um, um, 1 megawatt is. It's a bit of a huge gap that we see in the industry. So uh, the gap is huge, and then there have been various solutions that have tried to fill the gap. I'm sorry, the, the number I meant was 1,000 people, so that's one million. Yeah? And so this gap is filled by about 60 million generators, some of them small petrol and diesel generators that have come to fill in that gap. 
Um, we know the concerns around that pollution due to the emission, um, the noise, and I mean, there's been a lot of death around suffocation due to those fumes. Children cannot study at night, and health facilities are not functioning properly due to these challenges. In terms of bridging that gap, um, off-grid solutions have um, come to the rescue in the short term. Um, some of these off-grid solutions are sometimes mini grids or solar home systems. Um, it's assumed that about 250,000 units have been installed. This was at the end of 2018. Hopefully, much more this time. But it's clear that some of these solutions um, will take time. Um, mini grids are also becoming very popular. But they also take time and they require funding. So the challenge remains. Um, the opportunity is um, is quite huge, and, and funding remains a key requirement. In terms of the market, uh, it, it's about 120 million people lacking access. So that's a huge gap that needs to be filled. Um, about 190 depending on the population size here we're referring to. So if it's, if it's a 200 million population size, then that's a huge gap as well. Um, the distribution companies currently providing ongoing power um, have suffered and continue to suffer huge losses and debt. Um, a lot of them haven't been able to raise additional finances due to the liquidity issues within the national grid. So that remains a challenge. But um, as I mentioned before, upgrade solutions are definitely playing a huge role. Uh, Many grid, solar home systems, standalone systems, and the market for that is said to be about ten billion dollars um, annual revenue. So it's a huge opportunity that um, developers, investors are all looking to see how they can plug in. Um, <clears throat> it's said that there are about ten thousand suitable mini grid sites um, by the study being done by the Rural Electrification Agency along with the World Bank. And that's um, the size of the market for solar home system is about a half million units. So um, I think it's a huge opportunity for anyone looking to find a market that is large enough to absorb um, the need and that is willing to make a difference. In terms of financing solutions, um, there are various solutions that have over time been used, and I'll spend some time on on a few of those solutions, providing more context to in terms of what has been done. So impact investors have been one of the key players in the renewable sector in Nigeria. Um, I believe the major reason is that some of the traditional banks haven't really been able to uh, understand the sector. They still feel a bit skeptical. They are not used to it. Maybe their, their staff are not even used to handling such transactions, given how New the sector is in general compared to the traditional art sector, so it's um, it's understandable that they're taking their time there. The impact investors have over time been able to bridge the gap and and been able to provide funding. Um, I'll just talk about a few of them very briefly. All on um, is one of those organizations. Um, I worked there um, before my previous role, and all on is basically focused on providing funding various forms there. To clean energy companies across the value chain. Um, the focus is on low income households and SMEs. So, for companies that are within that sector and that require funding, um, that organization is able to provide that support. In terms of general um, planning, I need to provide a proper business plan, proper financial model that could be required for any other class of investment. So it's not, uh, when you say impact investor, some people think it's, um, is this a sort of a grant? No, not really. It's really just investment that people investors want to see an economic and a social um, impact from their investment. Um, other investors are in the market, um, one of them is Acumen. Acumen is, a, is an impact investor that is focused on the sector as well. They recently moved their African headquarters to Nigeria. So that's and a clear indication as to the size of the market. Um, they are focused on investment across the value chain as well. And another which is international is Breakthrough Energy Ventures. This is an organization that was um, sponsored by um, Bill Gates and Richard Branson. Um, they recently closed an investment in Nigeria, one of the 
local companies are energy for about nine billion dollars, along with other investors, including all on North Point and Electrify, which is also noted there. Electrify is another one of those companies um, or organizations is still funded and supported, um, providing funding to clean companies, renewable companies as well. Um, across Africa and specifically in Nigeria. Um, they have a 120 million global facility, but they also have um, a 30 million facility dedicated to the Nigeria market. So that's um, a very good opportunity. Consistent Energy is one of the other investors in the market. They are also focused on the renewable energy sector, uh, providing funding um, across the sector. So that's another potential source of funding. Sun Funder is a debt provider. They provide debt to renewable energy companies, as the name implies, Sun, so focused on solar. So that's another one of the impact investors in the market. There are a few others, um, largely international organizations within that group, um, a few local, but it's an interesting sector for them. And they see the impact, they see the educational, the health impact, the job creation, and all of that. And they, Sponsor that this segment of the market. Um, another group of investors in financing are the development finance institutions. So, most of these are bigger organizations that have bigger mandates but are just to carve a niche for the renewable energy sector. And one of those is AFD, the French organization. They have a facility in Nigeria, the Sunrest facility, for about 4 million euros. It's focused on supporting the local commercial banks with funding. Um, and um, they're working with a few local banks now, um, although I don't believe it's operational yet, but um, it's been pledged. Hopefully, it will come through soon. Um, the African Development Bank is another great support. Um, they provide funding, um, but mostly through bigger programs. And one of the programs I will discuss is. Um, one by the World Bank, um, along with the, which is one of the journals I have there, along with the African Development, with the Rural Education Agency. So African Deve the African Development Bank also supports funds, so they provide funds into other funds. Um, one of which is the Upgrade Energy Access Fund that closed um, last year, 2018. Um, the first close was about 60 million dollars, along with other partners, including all on and. Um, Nordic Development Foundation, Harvard, and others. Another one organization I've noted there is the Bank of Industry. So that's the local EFI. It's based in Nigeria. They have a renewable energy mandate as well, or a section that's focused on that, providing funding to the sector. Recently, actually, this year, um, they developed a fund along with all of a 1 billion Naira fund, to provide local currency financing to companies focus on the Niger Delta area of Nigeria. So in terms of funding, that's another source of funding that can be assessed if the project qualifies. In terms of donors, um, there's a wide range of donors uh, carrying out various activities. Some of the activities are more focused on technical assistance, um, while others actually provide some bit of funding for projects. So um, one of these is DFID, which is focused on the Sula Nigeria program which we're running and should be ending in 2020, I believe. Um, they provide grants for projects um, that are deploying um, solar solutions, solar home systems specifically. Um, GIZ is another. They provide grant funding for CAPEX, for procurement of capital um, expenditure items um, across the country. They have various programs that are running at the moment. Um, another is Shell Foundation. Um, they have a program that they're running, um, it's called the NUMA. Um, it's one of the programs where they provide support, they conduct studies, support the market and help the market grow. Then there are various U.S. companies and um, organizations, so there's the, the U.S. ADF and the U.S. CDA. Um, they provide funding in different forms. The U.S. ADF provides um, some grants, matching grant funding um, through a program with all on. Um, about fifty thousand uh, dollars. While USCD is mostly focused on providing and funding for feasibility studies. If you have a project that needs to be and you need to do a study, it can potentially provide that support. 
Um, I'll just mention a few others. So the green bond, um, this is an idea that has been going on, I think, being discussed recently. Um, although the argument for green bonds is that most of the countries or the renewable energy countries are small, so they might not be able to um, attract a large bond size. Um, the other argument has been that there's potential to actually group companies together or group projects together and actually issue a green bond that can now raise funding. Um, recently, in 2018, I believe, um, the Nigerian government issued a sovereign green bond. Um, so that's a good start. And um, we're still looking to find a way where companies can come together to do projects that would attract them the kind of funding they require from the capital market and from other institutional investors. For local financial institutions, um, it's a bit slow. Um, most of them, as I mentioned before, are still trying to get used to the market. So they don't quite understand the sector as well as they would like to. But a few banks are leading the way. For example, Sterling Bank, they've been, um, they've been very well immersed in the sector and have actually been able to close a few deals um, recently. UBA and Access Bank are one of the banks that are under the AFG program I mentioned before, where they're supposed to do on lending um, based on the funds from AFG. And FCMB also has a mandate actually for, for renewable energy. In terms of crowdfunding, there are a few options and a few organizations, renewable energy organizations, that actually bring funding in, through this source. So where various people, hundreds of people, uh, provide funding for a particular project that the company has set out to. I mean, there are various companies in this range, um, better bed, Kira, that I mentioned here, but there's Lens Hand, and there are a few others in the market that are providing this service. Um, it's very attractive to a lot of people, and even young people, differently, because people want to be associated with um, impactful projects sustainable projects, and I think the, the level of awareness is growing um, very recently about the need for clean energy solutions. So this is becoming very attractive as companies where they need to raise really quick funding or working capital, they're able to do that through this source. So this is not an exhaustive list. This is just a general list of various options that are typically available for fundraising and for investment. I'll just add, just in case um, some some people are not very familiar with the investment instruments, I'll just give a brief overview of the types of instruments that some of these organizations provide. So in terms of um, donors, most times it's grants. Some are repayable that you need to pay back. Some are not repayable, so you're, you're allowed to use the funding as you wish. Um, but the repayable grants, most times recently, it's being designed as a resolve these financing. In this case, you would need to actually deploy the project with some money, and then down the line, you get back funding after the project has been verified. So that will be a grant, but it will be after the fact, and then you can use that to provide and develop on the other projects. Um, in terms of other instruments that have been used, um, debt is one of the popular ones. So in terms of debt, it's the funding that is provided to be paid over either a short or a longer period of time. So it could be working capital where you pay off people within a one year period, or it could be a terminal where you pay off in a number of years. So you pay a fixed uh, principal, and then you pay an interest on the sum on either a quarterly basis, semi-annual, or a yearly basis. Equity has been a very important form of funding that sometimes we seem to be lacking. So FPT helps to provide um, shareholders fund to the company. And most times, when when you're, you need to get there, most times um, organizations want to see that you have put some skin in the game or that you have some equity funding to match the debt that you're receiving. So that's a, a very important form of funding that takes more risk because you're not really guaranteed any returns on the periodic basis. Sometimes there might be dividend, but it's not always the case. Um, the return might be plowed back into the business to help the business grow. So these are just a few examples of some of the forms of um, funding provided. Other forms that are a bit more um, complex are in terms of guarantees to the organizations that provide guarantees uh, to, to support the investments that have been made. It could be a first loss guarantee to say, okay, in case um, you don't repay the funds, 
then this will be see, you can you can draw on this one. Um, a few companies that are providing that sort of form of guarantee in Nigeria. Um, one is InfraCredit. They have support from Garant School as well as the Nigerian Sovereign Investment um, NSI, the Nigerian um, company organization. Rather. So basically, those that is one of the companies that provides guarantee. Or other companies or other organizations, maybe those who don't know the GFI, who provide other forms of guarantee. Um, in terms of impact, I'll just speak very briefly about the impact. Most of you probably already know, given that um, you're involved in the sector in one form or the other, or the other, or you're looking to be involved. The impact we've seen is 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 really amazing. Um, sometimes it's not as measurable as we'd like. Or you see it in the improved livelihood of beneficiaries of this funding. So you see businesses being able to deliver more, they're able to produce more, they're able to open, be open for longer hours a day, they're able to employ more people, they're able to be more productive, especially if you have productive appliances going along with the, the solar home systems or whatever it is. Um, those productive appliances help the businesses to actually do their business better. So it could be a clipper, a solar clipper that you provided that business, and they're able to do much more instead of spending um, funds on kerosene or, for, or diesel or petrol for a generator. Um, it could be drying, like a, a solar dryer for fishing, for fishermen. It could be fishing lights that are solar powered that are used during fishing to help to increase the amount of which is caught. So we see that this impact is a full range, is environmentally friendly, and um, given the fight against climate change, um, it's very crucial that um, provide the right funding and investment to renewable energy companies. Um, schools, hospitals are able to perform better. I mean, it could be one school in one community that's provided a good solution and changes the, the outcome of that community over the next generation. So in terms of even productivity and competitiveness of businesses, we see that businesses are, are more competitive, their, their costs are reduced, even that large chunk of cost for businesses is typically spent on energy. So when you reduce the amount that you spend on energy, I mean, you become automatically, you become, um, you become better and you're able to, to perform better than your peers. So in general, these are the, um, these are the few areas I thought to touch on in this um, webinar in terms of the areas that are very crucial um, for investment and financing. And maybe if I have some time um, to take some questions, I might touch on um, an area around uh, the key areas that um, investors look out for when they're accepting a project or a solution. Um, if I have some time, I might touch on that. But I think that there's a huge opportunity for students um, and for able to, to join this sector. I mean, we don't have to, you don't have to be technical, although I know most of you are technical, there's opportunities to go into other parts of the business. It could be finance, it could be um, health and safety, it could be human resources, given the amount of human capital required for this sector. So I, I, I believe that there are great opportunities for innovative solutions that are cheaper, and, and given your background in engineering, I think we'll be relying on you to provide these solutions. I mean, these solutions will have to be taken through the overall investment process, which I keep out of time, I'll, I will talk about. But in general, these are some things I thought to highlight. Thank you. Well, thank you, Ajunwa. That was very, very fascinating. That was very good to learn, too, how 120 million people lack access to energy. Um, but, you know, there are so many uh, financial opportunities available. What, in your experience, how do national regulations and energy affect investment opportunities in Nigeria? Okay. Um, I think that national regulations um, are very important uh, for the developers that are invested or that have deployed the solution to the investors as well on the planet here. Yeah. Um, it's very important for developers and for even investors to have comfort that when they are putting a solution in place, um, the regulations in place will not change after a few months and the investments will now go down the drain. 
it is very important that regulations put in place are tried and tested, they are predictable, they are clear, and they are actually implemented properly. I give a quick example. Um, the mini grid regulation in Nigeria has been said to be one of the best across Africa because it's been very clear on the key areas. So in terms of, okay, if a mini grid is in a certain location and the grid comes to that location, what happens to that mini grid? And even in terms of what kind of compensation do you get if you have to, for, for any reason, um, sell your mini grid to the grid when it comes there, or just things around the types of permits required, and just the, the level of clarity is very encouraging. So I believe that um, national regulations are very, very important. They are crucial, and they provide the comfort required by both the developers and the investors in any of these projects. That's great to learn, yeah. And I think that's um, that's a wonderful point that you made in general. Um, I just want to say thank you again for taking the time to meet with us to do this presentation. We really appreciate it. Um, I also want to say a special thank you to IEEE uh, for sponsoring the virtual salon. And um, thank you to everyone who's been, been watching this special edition. My name is Jana Melpolder, and I work as a web, webinar producer at Engineering for Change. On behalf of myself and my entire team, uh, thanks to everyone again. Have a great day. All right. Thank you. <laughs> Bye.